Thank you, welcome. We are the powerhouse big band. That was Strike Up the Band. That was the famous Sammy Nestico arrangement. It was done by uh, done for the Basie Band, the Count Basie Orchestra. Um, it's worth your time to go and watch the Count Basie Orchestra do that as well. Um, they, they're so relaxed while they're playing it. It's just a, it's a master class in artistry. They're almost as relaxed as the band you just saw. <laughs> I decided, well, I didn't decide, it actually just kind of happened this way, um, to do a bunch of songs that were either made popular or written during the 1950s, 1960s cool jazz era. So for those of you who don't know, cool jazz is a subgenre of jazz. It's not, all jazz is cool, of course, we know. It's things we know. Uh, but uh, cool jazz is a subgenre that happened in the 1950s and 1960s. It was defined, as you might imagine, by its more mellow, um, sort of uh, approach to performance. Uh, famous cool jazz that exists a lot this time of year, of course, is the Charlie Brown Christmas album everybody's familiar with. That is a kind of a quintessential example of cool jazz. Well, all of the, uh, most of the songs, I should say, that we're going to play tonight fall within that either era or style. And again, it just happened that way. Count Basie's band was more or less the most cool of the big bands that were extant during that time, and again, that was written for that group. The next tune doesn't fit that description at all, but that's okay, we're going to play it anyway. The next tune was written for Maynard Ferguson, who was kind of the antithesis of cool jazz. He was loud, high, and fast most of the time, but this one's actually a ballad. It's going to feature our trumpet player, Mr. Tom Walsh, and Carrie Martin on the lead trumpet, and also George Smick on the piano. And it's called Buck Beautiful.
arrangement of, of Peggy Lee's That's My Style. So the first, how? Stand up and introduce yourself to everybody. <laughs> how? I think everybody who listens to jazz in Baltimore knows how. He's one of our jazz friends in Baltimore. He just got back from a cruise. Did you? He didn't bring his lady friends back though. This one's for you, Hal. Oh, 
outside our We're going to hear more from Chris shortly. One of the things that was done during the cool jazz era was that a lot of what you would call counterpoint was written in jazz for more or less the first time. Counterpoint is when you have multiple melody lines kind of weaving in and out of each other to create harmony. This is something that is distinctly Western European. Bach, of course, was a master at it. Interestingly, there was a piano player that lived in Chicago and then New York named Lenny Tristano, the famous jazz piano player to those that are in the know. And he had all of his students, most of whom ended up being kind of the who's who of cool jazz musicians, including Miles Davis' band on Earth of the Cool, he had all of them transcribe Bach and learn how to play them in jazz style. So what that led to was, again, the use of counterpoint in jazz very widely in the 1950s. Well, the next tune was written by Eric Richards fairly recently. He's one of our military arrangers. And it's a tune, an older tune called There Is No Greater Love, but it features counterpoint just like that. And it features a lot of the devices that were employed by the composers and arrangers of the 1950s, especially uh, Jerry Mulligan on the Miles Davis and then on his own albums. And so again, this one's called There Is No Greater Love. It's going to feature a, uh, the melody is actually carried by the bass and the guitar. So Jim Stewart and Bruce Baggin are going to carry the melody for you. So please enjoy it. It's There Is No Greater Love.
very much for that. The gifts you are looking for. Next tune is by Neil Hefty. We've played tunes by Neil Hefty before. Um, I already mentioned the Basie Band. He wrote for the Basie Band. But Neil Hefty is actually more famous for what he did after the Basie Band, so during the era that I'm talking about. This is the first time in which film music really started to be strongly influenced by jazz. As most of you probably are aware, in the late 50s and early 60s, pretty much all of the major film scores and soundtracks became jazz-oriented, which is really great for jazz musicians at the time because they were out of work because all of the sweet bands had folded up. So this was a tune that Neil Hefty wrote. Again, Neil Hefty, he was uh, he wrote Batman and The Odd Couple among a bunch of other things that, that we all know. And I heard this tune, it's called The Creeper, and it sounds like something out of a Pink Panther episode. When I first heard it, I was like, this, this is something, he wrote this for a show, and the show got canceled or something. This, it, it sounds exactly like something like that. Turns out that's not the case. This actually predates all of his show work. This is something that he wrote, and um, he just wrote it because it, it sounds like a creeper. <coughs> You're going to see. It sounds exactly like a creeper. But again, uh, I had thought that this was something that he had written for a show, but it wasn't. But you're going to see that it uh, profoundly influenced the way that he wrote later on. So again, this is Neil Hefty, and it's called The Creeper.
Hey, see what I mean? Yeah, he wrote that for some show, didn't he? Yeah. It never got published, though. We're never going to know. The next tune was written by George, our piano player. As you can see, if you had the program in front of you, later on in the program, there's a whole George section. Uh, this one predates that in the program. It's called Blues for Megan. Um, it was written for a student of his, Megan Zontek. Um, John Zontek is a, is a trombone player. He played for the Naval Academy Band for quite some time. And I just found out that they actually, the reason why George wrote this piece is because his daughter, Megan, was a student of George's for quite some time. For how long, George? Nine. Nine years. It's a long time to study piano. Especially with George. <laughs> he said it. He said it. It wasn't me. So we're going to play this. It features a lot of people. Um, I will announce them afterwards because I don't remember them right now. So this is Blues for Megan. Thank you. 
George Hick on the piano. He also wrote that. Gives you the guitar. John Tesla on the drums. Much like Howard on the tenor saxophone. Tony Sandinari on the trombone. Michael Allman on the trombone. And Tom Walsh on the trumpet. Speaking of TV themes, going back to that subject for a moment, um, the Tonight Show band was originally led, well, it was actually originally led by Skitch Henderson, but after that, it was led by Doc Severinsen, trumpet. The next tune was co-written by him and the writer for the Tonight Show band for the longest time, Tommy Newsom. And it's the ballad that they would end the night with, The Way I Feel About You. It's a great tune, but it reminds me of a Doc Severinsen song. So I play with the wedding band contractor, and we do all these wedding band gigs around the D.C., Baltimore area. We get, you know, there are hundreds of weddings a year that we do, and, you know, I would say roughly one out of every five weddings, somebody wants to play or sing with the band. It's usually a pretty big drag. Just saying. <coughs> Somebody's like, oh, you know, can so-and-so, you know, sit in with the band, and everybody on the band goes, oh, for God's sake. This is gonna be miserable. And so this, you know, bride comes up, she's like, my uncle, my great uncle wants to sit in with the band. You know? He's a trumpet player and he's good. He can, you know, he can hang, he can play or whatever. And a bunch of, I wasn't on this gig, but you know, the story goes that all the guys were rolling their eyes and really upset. And apparently the trumpet player gets up there and just all of a sudden just starts like screaming high notes. So, you know, apparently it was a, a 90 year old Doc Severinsen. <laughs> it just happened this past, this past summer. So, so be careful. Next time you roll your eyes when you're on a wedding day, all you people know you're going to do this. So this is The Way I Feel About You, which is again by Doc Severinsen and Tommy Newsom.
you guys recognize that? Is that something I should have known before this semester? No, I'm just, just kidding. Alice, you want to sing some more? I'm in more strong. <laughs> <laughs> That's two full acts. I get it. So how many do it? Just this one. We're going to do another San Unesco tune before we take a short break. This one was done. I think this is Ella with the Basie Band, but don't quote me on that. This is one called All Right, Okay, You Win. It's a shuffle. <coughs> Sammy doesn't do too many vocal arrangements, and um, it's really cool to do one by him because he's a really cool guy. If you ever, if you don't know anything about Sammy, Sammy Nestico, look him up and read about him a little bit. He's um, an elderly gentleman now, but he's still kicking and he's still loves this stuff and he still writes occasionally. So we hope you enjoy this. It's all right. Okay, you win. Thank you. 
go ahead and introduce the rest of the organization to you. Mr. John Kessel on the drums. Mr. Bruce Bagg on the bass. Mr. Jim Stewart on the guitar. We're going to get back into the large group stuff now. This is another one of George's arrangements, though. I'm a classic tune on Green Dolphin Street. It's going to feature our vocalist, Mrs. Alice Schlotthauer. So, a long, long time ago, well, not that long ago, I guess. Time flies when you're getting as old as I am. Um, George came to me and he said, I want to write an arrangement for you of one of your favorite songs. And I said, well, Green Dolphin Street is one of my favorite songs and I know of no big band arrangement for it. So, he kindly and wonderfully wrote this arrangement. Um, I can't even tell you how honored I am to be able to sing it. So this is George's group on Green Dolphin Street. Thank 
Thanks. I, this whole semester I've been totally amazed and in awe, if you want to say that. There's a young gentleman in this band right now. This is Sir Tyler White. Tell them how old you are. Fourteen. He walked into this band and wowed every single one of us. He came in. His instructor also started in this band when he was 14. And I guess he got a hold of Tyler and was truly impressed with Tyler's abilities. And he called us up and he said, I have this student. I remember being in this band when I was his age and how much I learned and how much I loved it and I'd really like to recommend him. And luckily we had a space for Tyler and gosh, I hope Tyler comes back. While we're on the subject, we've got a couple of people that are filling holes for us tonight, and I wanted I wanted to recognize them because we had, um, unfortunately, we had some people not be able to make the, um, the concert tonight, and so they let us know in advance, and um, and so we got some subs. So Tony, Leo, and Bobby in the in the trombone saxophone and trumpet sections are all filling in for us tonight. So we really appreciate their help. So the next tune is going to feature our saxophone section. It was written by a saxophonist named Phil Woods, so uh, hopefully you've all been paying attention and taking notes and everything. I mentioned Lenny Tristano earlier, the cool jazz kind of um, teacher that had a bunch of students that were on a bunch of famous albums. Phil Woods was actually one of Lenny Tristano's students, so he famously, um, he played in pretty much everyone's bands at some point. He played with Dizzy, he played with um, Thelonious Monk, he played with Maynard, played with Woody Herman, which I believe this, this particular, no, this tune was written for his own band. Uh, but this is a ballad called Randy, and once again, it's gonna feature our saxophone section and uh, Mr. Ben Schuert on the alto saxophone.
Ben Schuert on the alto saxophone. Aaron Villamizer on the alto saxophone. Mike Schlothauer on the tenor saxophone. Leo Randenberg on the tenor saxophone. And Tyler White on the very tenor saxophone. We also heard from Michael Allman on the trombone. It's time. It's too soon. We've been meaning to do this song soon for a while. That's the joke. That, that was it. Come on, John. Thank you. So, no, no discussion of 50s jazz would be complete without some reference to the Great American Songbook Recordings by Ella Fitzgerald. The next two songs are both from that collection. Um, they are both Nelson Riddle arrangements that yeah, were indeed done for Ella for the Great American Songbook Recordings. They both originally had strings, and one, of them, one day soon we will try and get some. But for now, we will just do it with the ensemble we have. Again, this is a George Gershwin song arranged by Nelson Riddle, soon. Yeah. 
here one more time for Mrs. Alice Schoenhauer. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a couple more songs for y'all tonight. Before we go on, I want to go ahead and introduce the brass section. Starting from the upper right back there, we have Mr. Bobby List on the trumpet. Stan Maros on the trumpet. Kerry Martin on the trumpet. And Tom Walsh on the trumpet. Coming down, you've already heard from Michael Allman on the trombone. Tony Sedinari on the trombone. Dr. Ed Stubing on the trombone. And Fred Golding on the trombone. So we've got a couple more songs for you. Um, this next one is in the tradition of the contrapuntal, the counterpoint jazz. Um, very much so, in fact, this tune sounds very much like a song that was made famous at the, in the 1950s by Chet Baker and Jerry Mulligan. It was a song called Lion for Lions. And it was a song, uh, well, not just a song, but the style in general was famous because of their use of counterpoint. They used counterpoint so often they actually had a group with no piano player in it because they didn't want another piano player to interfere with the things that they were doing. It's pretty interesting. And this one borrows a lot from that. This is a different standard called I'll Take Romance, and it was arranged by Lenny Niehaus. Lenny Niehaus is a famous arranger who you all have heard because he arranged pretty much every Clint Eastwood movie music from the 1960s until now. So. Again, this is a tune called I'll Take Romance.
Bob was asking. Bob also is from the So before we go, I'd like to thank uh, Jason Randolph and the staff in the hall here. That was very helpful. And we could not do this without them. I'd also like to thank my boss, Ms. Patty Crossman. For all of her support. Our last tune is a, a salsa tune. So most people don't know this. I always kind of pose this question to my students. Um, where is salsa from? Everybody says, oh, it's in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Mexico. It's actually from the United States. Um, it was invented in New York City in the 1950s, so it's consistent with the era that we're talking about here. This particular tune was written by a friend of mine, Mr. Jeff Jarvis, who was actually the person that was in charge of Kendor Publishing, which is a big music publisher for a long time in, in California. And he wrote this tune, and it's a perfect example of a salsa that has been translated very well to big band, which is very rare. Because it focuses on individual sections that change as the piece goes by, which is consistent again with salsa because the dance actually changes for the different sections. If there are any salsa dancers in the audience, you know that salsa has these different eight bar repeated sections. And this piece actually works very well. A lot of salsa pieces don't translate very well to Big Band. And so we're going to play it. It's called Las Colinas, and it features Aaron Villamizer on the flute, Michael Schlotthauer on the tenor saxophone. Tony Centenary on the trombone, and Stan Maros on the trumpet. I'd like to thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Please enjoy. Thank you. Have a happy holidays afterwards, and please all drive safe getting home. Thank you. 
Thank you all so much for coming. Please join Shakespeare.